Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. A man was there by the name of Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was wealthy. He wanted to see who Jesus was, but because he was short, he could not see over the crowd. So he ran ahead and climbed a sycamore fig tree to see him, since Jesus was coming that way. When Jesus reached the spot, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, come down immediately. I must stay at your house today. So he came down at once and welcomed him gladly. All the people saw this and began to mutter, He is gone to be the guest of a sinner. But Zacchaeus stood up and said to the Lord, Look, Lord, here and now I give half of my possessions to the poor, and if I have cheated anybody out of anything, I'll pay back four times the amount. Jesus said to him, Today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. So if you've got your uh, Bibles, if you could have them open then at the passage that was read to us from Luke um, and chapter 19. Excuse me while I just saw out the microphone. There we go. <laughs> Didn't realise it was that much taller than everyone else. There we go. No, it's not having that either. There we go. There we got there in the end. Right, okay, so this morning we're looking at uh, that passage that was read to us, Luke 19 and verses 1 to 10. Um, I want to ask you a question. Are trees good? Seems like an odd question, doesn't it? Are trees good? Uh, you would have to have been living underground, wouldn't you, for the last 40 years if you didn't know the answer to that question. Of course, trees are good for us. There are well-documented benefits of carbon uh, absorption that uh, we hear about so much in these days. But added to that, according to the Woodland Trust, trees boost our physical and mental health in so many ways, as well as keeping our atmosphere rich in oxygen, oxygen even. Uh, they filter pollutants from the air, shade our trees when it's hot, and even improve our immunity. Research sh has shown that uh, chemicals called phytonicides uh, release by plants and trees, strengthen our immune, hormonal, uh, circulatory and nervous systems when we breathe them in. Trees also improve our quality of life, apparently, offering relief from the symptoms of anxiety and depression. That's perhaps why it's so good when you go for a walk um, out in the forest. In our passage today, trees are, or, or most particularly one tree, plays a significant part in Zacchaeus's life. Now you remember from last week, I'm sure, that Jesus is on his way to Jerusalem. He is headed to the pit of vipers that were his enemies. Uh, not enemies that Christ has chosen, by the way, but enemies that have chosen to hate him. They don't like him, they don't like what he stands for, they're not interested in what he has to say. They simply want him out of the way and he's on his journey and he's heading through Jericho and last time we looked at uh, Jesus on this journey as he's heading towards Jerusalem we discovered that uh, he met a blind man he met a blind man whose sight he restored whose life he changed forever in Jericho there is another divine appointment waiting uh, for the Lord Jesus and in our text this morning, we are given three obstacles to that divine appointment. There are three things that get in the way of, of Jesus meeting with this person, Zacchaeus. And the first thing we discover in verse 2 is that he was wealthy. 
Now, you remember, I'm sure, a few weeks ago now that we looked at the rich young ruler in uh, Luke chapter 18, and we were taught there that riches are an obstacle to faith, or can be. Uh, Luke puts it like this in, in verses 24 and 25, how hard it is for the rich to enter the kingdom of God. Indeed, it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for someone who is rich to enter the kingdom of God. So money gets in the way. It gets in the way of discovering who the Lord Jesus Christ is. It gets in the way of even thinking and contemplating who he is. The rich young ruler we discovered loved his money and he wouldn't choose Jesus over his money. Money was far too important to him. He would rather have his riches here and now in this life than have an eternity that was certain. That was the reality of his life. Well, Zacchaeus is one step worse in his relationship to money. Not only does he love money, but he will do whatever it takes to get it. To get it. He is a man who really doesn't have many scruples, as it were. We're told straight away that his role, his job is a chief tax collector. Now, I know that we don't like uh, the inland revenue too much. Uh, we don't like it, that feeling at the end of the year when we see how much of a chunk of our money that they have taken. Uh, but we actually understand that there is a, as an important um, process that goes on in order that the country might run. Well, here is Zacchaeus, and he is a man who is a Jew by birth, and he is working for the oppressors. He is working for the Romans who are in the land. He uh, is, he, he's, as it were, changed sides. If you went back to uh, the Second World War, it would be rather like, uh, and this happened in Jersey, that uh, some of the people suddenly decide to start working for uh, the, uh, uh, the invading force. And immediately the populace begins to fall out with such. Their lives might be comfortable and easy, uh, but here is Zacchaeus who is on the wrong team. He is playing on the side of those who are the oppressors. In fact, he's turned his back on his people, and he seems to have no worries or cares or concerns about that. Money is more important than where he has come from. Money is more important than getting on with people around him. And more than that, in his role as a tax collector, it would have been perfectly normal for him not only to collect the taxes for the Romans, but to add a significant percentage on top for himself. In other words, he didn't mind manipulating the figures. He had no care or concern for anything like that. So, so if the Romans told you that you owed two pennies, he would charge you four, just for the pleasure of him filling up his own coffers. Now, he's not alone in such thoughts, is he? Money is a great pull in the days in which we live. And once you have been caught in its glare, it's surprising what you will do to get it. Uh, in recent days, I've watched the series of documentaries called The Four Kings. It's on Prime, not that I'm advertising Prime. Um, but uh, uh, I watched The Four Kings. Now, if you don't know what that's about, well, it count, it's all about the best era of British boxing, the 1980s and the 1990s, which, of course, uh, was my era growing up, as it were. It covers Frank Bruno... Nigel Benn, Chris Eubank, and Lennox Lewis. All kinds of issues are discussed in the film. And money drove them to all kinds of questionable choices. Frank Bruno, he is the most loved, I have to say, of all of those uh, men. Um, he uh, was involved in some advertising, which when you look back now, knowing all the issues of uh, of race that we do in uh, recent times. His um, advertising for HP and taking the position of a slave in so doing caused quite a bit of upset in his own community. And his motivation for doing so was money. 
That was as simple as it was. It caused him to get into panto when his boxing didn't go quite as well uh, as it might like, and that upset people in his community too. Lennox Lewis then took a hold of that, and uh, I don't know whether you remember back to that period, but he basically called him an Uncle Tom, uh, in effect, uh, somebody who was working for the other side, um, and that caused Frank Bruno to eventually have a breakdown. All in the cause of money. Lennox Lewis for treating him in that way, Frank Bruno for wanting his career to go so well. Money and our love of it can make us do bad things. And that's the reality, isn't it? And money gets in the way of a relationship with God. We know that. Uh, we know that it is a root of all kinds of evil. And so often we pursue it. Second thing he was, we're told in the text, is that he was a sinner. That comes in verse 7. Now, we are all sinners. If you're here this morning and you breathe, you are a sinner. You may not like that, but that is the reality of the situation. The Bible tells us that our sin wrecks our hope of a relationship with God. We are always doing wrong things. We are always doing things that God says aren't right, and we do them often with a great deal of enjoyment. We are all in the same boat. Romans puts it like this. Romans chapter 3 and verse 10. There is no one righteous, no, not even one. Now that's quite a damning statement, isn't it? All of us who would wish to be in eternity, all of us who would wish to know heaven and to know the joys of heaven have a, um, a very difficult problem. We are all sinners and on our own merits we will never please god of course we don't think like that do we we rank sinners we we rank people in according to what we consider that they have done wrong we think in terms of the obvious the in your face sins therefore in the eyes of all the people around zacchaeus was not worth or not worthy of having Jesus anywhere near him. And that is the response of the crowd when Jesus begins to show interest in Zacchaeus. This man is beyond the pale. Now, we can deal with many things, but believing that Jesus would have time for a low life like Zacchaeus is not one of them. He has fleeced money out of people left, right, and center. He has no conscience. And as far as humanity is concerned, he isn't worth Jesus' time of day. It would be a bit like, wouldn't it, um, you know, the, uh, the, the folk that ring you up and tell you that your credit card has gone into the red, and if you don't quickly give them your details... Um, that, uh, you know, you're going to find yourself in a very difficult position, knowing full well that once you've given them your credit, cr credit card details, basically you are going to be in a very difficult position because they've just stolen your money. This is the kind of guy that Zacchaeus is. He's not nice. He's not someone that you want to know. And it's a barrier, isn't it, to knowing God? Sadly, we can get into that kind of, uh, of mindset about people who hurt us. We can think uh, that we would prefer that they face God's wrath rather than any sign of his kindness. I've said it to you before. If you don't think that you have that kind of aggression, you wait till somebody cuts you up. You wait till someone crosses your path and treats you with the contempt that Zacchaeus is treating his fellow Israelites at this time. You might on your good days pray that God does something for them, but on most days you're praying down imprecatory prayers. God let them suffer because they've treated me in this way. Prophet Jonah, if you know the Old Testament, uh, Prophet Jonah fell into that trap in the account of his life. God sent him to Nineveh, to a foreign nation, 
to tell them to repent. And Jonah ran away rather than go. He would rather defy God than take a message from God to a people whom he considered to be beyond the pale. And you know, he wasn't wrong. He did not want God to communicate with the Ninevites. He, he wanted them eradicated and judged. Their sins, just in case you didn't know this, were on the level of the atrocities that the war, crime, uh, war crimes um, court prosecutes. These were not nice people. And Jonah is horrified that God would go towards this group of people in any form of grace. He didn't want them to know. Finally, he does as he's told, but if you know anything about the book of Jonah, he's thoroughly miserable about doing it. How can you be so gracious, Lord? He's a sinner. Third thing we discover, and it's perhaps not quite so in your face, but we discover that he's short. Verse 3 tells us that, doesn't it? Perhaps Zacchaeus's miniature stature drove him to pursue the, the, uh, the uh, career that he took. Perhaps he was fed up with being ridiculed for his height disadvantage. We're unkind as people generally, aren't we? Someone struggles or is different than us, we make fun of them. We make their lives difficult. Perhaps he viewed his paper, his behavior towards other people as little more than they deserved. After all, he has been treated badly. Consider the complex that they have given him. He would make them serve him if they don't want to be his friends, if they don't want to treat him well. Now, I'm speculating. I don't know whether that's exactly what Zacchaeus is like, but you know, that's what we do, don't we? We blame the struggles on our, in our lives upon others. And here is Zacchaeus who's struggling to get to see Jesus purely because of his height. Many things make up a person's life, yet none of them excuse us from willfully disobeying God and of mistreating others. Yet that's exactly what we do, isn't it? If we feel that we've had a difficult backgrounding, uh, background and hard upbringing, then we blame others, and then we carry on living in such a way that dishonors God, and we think it excuses us. Now, whatever of that is true, suddenly as Zacchaeus wants to get to see Jesus, his height becomes a real problem to him. Uh, the crowd is full of normal heighted people, and Zacchaeus wants to see. Uh, whatever has grabbed Zacchaeus' attention, he is prepared, actually, to commit a demeaning act. He is prepared to give up his dignity just to get a, get a glimpse of Jesus. Maybe it was the celebrity appeal as Jesus comes by. Uh, maybe it's who Jesus is and he's perhaps heard something of his reputation. And that has called him to want to know more. We don't know his true motivation. We only know that he wants to see Jesus. We only know that it's enough to propel him up a tree. Most likely with the kids now. He's not in here, so I can say it about him. But you'll remember um, that uh, Joseph climbs like a monkey. And he was forever up that fire escape round there. And I think you had scaffolding up your house, didn't you? And he was always on the top of that. Here is Zacchaeus, a full-grown man, who is largely hated. And he is so desperate to see Jesus that he's up the tree with the kids. His height is a problem, but he's prepared to use a tree to get over it.
is the only thing that Zacchaeus could actually do, isn't it? Can't overcome his other problems, but he can just deal with that one. And you know, it's true of each and every one of us that if we really want to see Jesus, we can. So how then does Jesus overcome, overcome those obstacles for him? Well, we discover that he removes the barriers in verse 5. Jesus went straight to Zacchaeus. Here he is, he's busy, he's heading for the cross. He's heading for where he is going to deal with the sins of all mankind. He is headed to face his enemies. He's got really important things to do. And on his way, Zacchaeus, that really unworthy guy, is up a tree, keen to see him. And so Jesus makes a beeline to the tree that Zacchaeus is in. And although there are throngs of so-called worthy people around him, all he is interested in doing is seeing the one up the tree. He didn't care that others would be upset about him seeking him out. And he didn't care what they would say about him if he went to Zacchaeus' house. What Jesus saw was a man in desperate need of a heart change, of desperate need of a transformation that would change everything in his life. He saw, he saw through the outward displays to the loneliness and the desperation that was on the inside. He saw a fallen man in need of a gracious saviour. Was what Zacchaeus was doing wrong? Of course it was. Was what Zacchaeus lived like how God wanted him to live? No. Was he beyond hope? No. None of us are beyond hope. None of us have gone too far that Jesus cannot cast aside all of the barriers and invite you to dine with him. Jesus comes towards us all this morning in grace. No matter what you have done, no matter where you've come from, no matter the circumstances of your life, Jesus comes to you this morning and says, I want to dine with you. I want to spend time with you. It's grace that is overwhelming and unexpected. Put yourself in Zacchaeus' position up that tree. Pretty humiliating place to be found. But how overwhelmingly pleased would you be that Jesus, this one that you want to see, invites you, or invites himself, as it were, to your house. Second thing we see that he does is he changes Zacchaeus' heart. That comes in verse 8. Um, one meeting with Jesus changed everything for him. Suddenly, all that seemed important, all that seemed to offer him what he wanted, is brushed aside. He wanted a lifestyle. He wanted to be known as someone. He wanted to get ahead and have success. He wanted money. And all of that is brushed to one side in order that he might see Jesus. And that act of grace of Jesus talking to him, of inviting him to divine with him, melted that hard heart that Zacchaeus had. It was not just a I like Jesus moment. This was a, a, a radical, all that I have lived up, for, lived for up to this point is just not worth having in comparison to knowing Christ. It's like Apostle Paul's reaction in Philippians chapter 3 and verses 7 and 8. But whatever were gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. And what is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things, I consider them garbage that I may gain Christ. 
Now, where are you in your life at this moment? What, what is it that is, is barring you from coming and seeking Jesus? What is it that you are holding on to with both hands desperately, and yet you know that it is, it is hurting you, that it is harming you, that it is leading you away from God? Are you prepared to give it up? Because Jesus wants you to come to him. Jesus wants you to open up your home, as it were, your hearts to him. He wants that he would dine with you. And what he's getting in the way is all of that rubbish that you are holding on to. And all it is are but trinkets. They are not worth having. They are garbage, as Paul writes in his book to the Philippians. Zacchaeus displays a complete heart change as he admits his wrongdoing and he wants to make restitution. How do you know when somebody is truly sorry for what they have done wrong? Have you ever pondered that question? What we like to do is simply say sorry and then not show that we are truly sorry. But this affects Zacchaeus to the extent that all that he has clawed to get a hold of he suddenly lets go of and says well it's of no real worth and and actually all the people that I have hurt I am going to do good for them Zacchaeus heart is working in a completely different way why because he has met Jesus his repentance is in the spirit of the demands that the law makes. Uh, in uh, Numbers chapter 5 and, and verses 5 to 7, uh, the Lord said to Moses, Say to the Israelites, any man or woman who wrongs another in any way and so is unfaithful to the Lord is guilty and must confess the sin that they have committed. They must make full restitution for the wrong that they have done, add a fifth of, uh, sorry, and add a fifth of the value to it, and give it all to the person that they have wronged. And there are other verses in the Old Testament that point to that. And here is Zacchaeus, so convicted of all that he has done wrong, as he is prepared to do all that the law says, and even a little bit more. Have you ever been so convicted that you would confess that you were wrong and that you would give up the very thing that you've clawed to get a hold of in order that you might be right with God? Have you ever felt like that? Because that's a humbling experience, isn't it? Now, we don't need to speculate whether Zacchaeus' heart has changed whether it's true salvation, because Jesus makes it plain, he makes it plain in verse 9, Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house, because this man too is a son of Abraham. Zacchaeus has gone from being an enemy of the people of Israel, and an enemy of God, to being a true son of Abraham, who is at peace with his eternal father. That's no small transformation. And Jesus has worked that work in his life. Who are the true children of Abraham? Well, we're told, aren't we, in Romans chapter 4 and verse 6, 16, therefore the promise comes by faith so that it may be by grace and not be... Uh, may not, and let me try reading that again. Therefore the promise comes by faith so it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offerings, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is father of us all. If you believe in Jesus, if he has forgiven your sin, the Bible says that you're a true child of Abraham. In other words, you are child by faith. And Zacchaeus has gone from being an enemy to being a true child of God. The only one who can mend your heart and bring you into the family of God is Jesus. 
don't care what you've done this morning. I don't care how righteous you feel that you are. The only way that you will ever get into God's family, the only way that you will ever know an eternity which is secure is to put your faith wholly and completely in Jesus Christ and him alone. There is no other way. And that's what we're told, isn't it? The last verse, he comes to seek and to save the lost, verse 10. Verse 10 uh, gives us again the claim that Jesus is uh, the one promised of God who would become the forever king. He is the son of man. Going back to Daniel and the promise that is made there. His whole plan and purpose being to come and to rescue lost sinners just like Zacchaeus and just like you and me. If you are guilty of sin, if you aren't worthy of God, if you have uh, in one way or other messed up in your life, Jesus has come to rescue you. Don't look around yourself and think, well, I'm glad he's come to rescue whoever it is next to you. But consider this, he's come to rescue you. Just like Zacchaeus climbed a tree to reach Jesus, Jesus has climbed a tree to reach you. Not just any tree, but the tree of punishment designed for criminals. He was punished there so that your sin can be forgiven, so that that which was lost can be found. 1 Peter puts it like this, 1 Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, he himself, that's Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the tree so that we might die to sins and live for righteousness. By his wounds, you have been healed. In other words, Jesus is, is punished in order that you might get off scot-free for all the sins that you have ever committed, will ever commit. The question is, do you believe that Jesus died on that tree in your place? At this point in Luke's account of Jesus' life, he hasn't done that yet, has he? But the fact that it was already determined by God, the fact that Jesus had already decided, that meant that its power could reach back to save Abraham. It meant that its power could reach back to save Zacchaeus. And we who have lived after the event know that his power reaches forward to rescue even us. Christ today offers you, the guilty sinner that you are, to have your sins forgiven, your heart changed, and your life truly found, your soul saved. Isn't that too much to give up? Surely everything that you have in your life can be thrown aside in order that your soul might be secured for eternity by Jesus Christ. Nothing else is worth risking your soul for, is it? No matter how wonderfully it glitters, no matter how much you think it adds meaning to your life, it wants to be chucked aside in order that you might know Christ and all that he has done for you. He did it for Zacchaeus. He has done it for you. Trees are very good. But the best role a tree ever played was the one on which Jesus completed his work of eternal salvation. His act on that tree was truly life-giving, truly amazing. So those of you who thought I'd gone all eco know that in fact there is nothing better, there's no greater message than the message of the Lord Jesus Christ.
and he who saves. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that you are so very good to us. We thank you for the grace that is displayed to us in the Lord Jesus Christ. Father, help us to see how desperately unworthy we are of Christ, but help us to see desperately, too, how much we need him. Lord, forgive our sin, we pray, and grant that we might know Christ and know him in all his fullness. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.